We appreciate you coming in this morning, and we hope that you've had a, a very uh, a pleasant time and informative time at the, the first NABS um, ASLO uh, meeting. We hope we have more of these in the future. Uh, today we're going to have uh, several speakers, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about them um, and eating into their time. So uh, in most cases, you can just read your program and find out all about them, or at least what they want to tell you, admit to. Uh, the first talk is going to be given uh, jointly by Stuart Bunn and Cliff Dom. Uh, Stuart is the uh, pro uh, is a professor at uh, Griffith University and is director of the Australian Rivers Institute, which is a major, really big-time program in Australia. Uh, Cliff Dom is uh, normally a professor south of here at the University of New Mexico, uh, but for the last couple of years has been uh, on loan to the U.S. Geological S Survey working in uh, uh, California uh, on water issues there, but he'll be returning soon. The title of their talk today is Arid Land Rivers Boom and Bust or Buggered. Cliff is going to start off. Thank you all for getting up early. It's five days into this meeting. I'm exhausted. I'm sure many of you are also. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for Stuart Bunn and, and for Stuart Bunn and me to give you a, a little overview of dry land and arid land rivers of the world. Before I launch into that, I want to also uh, commemorate and remember a very important person in both our lives. Um, Stuart and I share more than just our rugged, handsome good looks. We also shared a very special person, my doctoral student, Christy Fellows, who came to the University of New Mexico and was here for uh, almost six years doing her PhD, getting a sense of what arid land rivers and streams were like. Uh, after her work here, she got a postdoctoral position in Brisbane, Australia, fell in love with the country and with the people, found her husband, Wade, married, became a faculty member at the Australian Rivers Institute at Griffith University, uh, was an outstanding teacher, and regrettably we lost her in December of 2008. Uh, we're, commemorate, we're commemorating her here in this talk. That we, were, we want to dedicate this talk to her. I also wanted to give you just a little overview of some of her professional accomplishments. Uh, this was a young woman who came to our graduate program with bachelor's degrees in both geology and biology, graduating summa cum laude from the University of Maryland. Uh, she was my doctoral student and then a postdoctoral student and then a faculty member with Stuart. She was an exceptional teacher and lecturer, loved very, very much by all the students that interacted with her, and also a very, very important researcher in the area of, uh, in, in the area of dry land and arid land streams. In addition, also worked a lot on things like ecosystem metabolism, hyperreic zones, riparian zones, and nitrogen biogeochemistry and, and riparian restoration. Um, her, her career was short, but she published a number of very uh, important papers. And we're remembering her in a very significant way uh, through the North American Benthological Society. We've started an endowment in her name called the Christie Fellows Endowment. We've raised over $55,000 to date in that fund. Uh, that fund is dedicated in perpetuity to bringing an Australian student or two to the NABS meetings in her memory. And the first student awardee came this year. So uh, this is one way that we're remembering Christy and we want to continue to grow this fund and remember her uh, by the young people that she'll influence for the rest of you know, the tenure of NABS. With that, I want to launch into the boom and bust part of the talk. I'm leaving the buggered part of the talk for Stuart Bunn. Um, let's talk a little bit about dry land rivers. 50% of the world's land mass could be characterized as arid or semi-arid, with nearly 40% of the human population living in these systems. Overall, these systems are relatively understudied. If you go in and look at the kind of papers that have been written on dry land or arid land rivers, you'll find that the Australians dominate. Uh, there are a lot of good work out of Australia. There are increasing number of papers coming out of other parts of the world, and I'll try to highlight at least a couple examples of that. And then the other area where arid land systems have been studied to some extent is, is here in the western and southwestern United States. So we're just going to give you a fairly broad brush tour of some of these kinds of research uh, topics in our plenary today. 
when you go to meetings, people often get up and talk about how variable their system is that they work on. Colleges seem to think that every system they work on is variable. I think here is a diagram that was put together about two decades ago, uh, or excuse me, about 13 years ago, uh, looking at variability using a number of hydrologic metrics of rivers all around the world using long-term hydrographs as a way of getting at uh, this variability component. And a couple points to make on this graph, and that is that uh, some of these arid land systems, like the Colorado and the Rio Grande, uh, are reasonably less variable. And the reason for that is that these systems do have a very predictable snowmelt hydrology to them that produces predictability in the flow regime. But you get down into some of these other arid land systems where the precipitation that drives their flow is episodic monsoonal precipitation, you really do get into some highly variable systems. And these systems here, um, Australian systems, are some of the most variable hydrologically in the world. And I think the, the Australian examples, you can certainly call them predominant in terms of variability. And the need then for the biotic communities to uh, learn how to basically survive in these kind of highly variable hydrologic systems. Just to give you an example, here's a couple hydrographs of a couple of these systems. This is Cooper Creek, the one that was the most variable on that previous graph. Here's the hydrograph from 1940 uh, to about 1990. This is the basin within Australia. And you can see that there are periods of high flows, intensely high flows, but there are also many periods of very long periods with no flow. So this kind of highly variable system is very... Uh, uh, very commonplace in these arid land systems around the world, and particularly uh, in areas of South America, in areas of Africa, and in areas of Australia. This is the um, hydrograph for the Rio Grande, very close to where we, are, where we sit today. This is uh, at Ottawa Gauge, just a few miles up the road. Uh, one of the longest gauges uh, active in the United States started in 1895. Uh, and this is just a, a 1970 to about 2009 record. And you can see, again, the variability, which is basically the variability in the intensity of the spring snowmelt. But you can also see that there is basal flow and stable flow uh, during even the low flow periods, uh, again, due to the fact that there is, they're draining some very high elevation areas and there is uh, both a, a groundwater-based flow and a snowmelt predictable flow. One of the things that characterizes many of these dryland or airland systems are these spectacular floods. And Here's some uh, pictures from the Cooper Creek Basin showing uh, the extent of the basin that can be flooded. These are also, in Australia, many of these are very low gradient systems with very little topographic variability. So when water does come into these systems, it moves out over the landscape and inundates huge areas of the system. Some of this water will ultimately end down in the Lake Eyre region. And this is just a picture of the Cooper Creek floodplain and one of the large floods that occurred in March of 2000 and then uh, uh, some examples of some of this water getting down into to the lower end of the terminus of the space in, in the lake air system. The response to these kinds of floods really do, are characterized by the booms. Uh, once water is added to these systems, uh, the biological communities respond, and sometimes in a very spectacular way. Many of these arid land systems, uh, not only do they respond with first a tremendous pulse of productivity, a lot of it driven by primary production around the edges of these systems, uh, some driven by heterotrophic activity on the detrital material that's mobilized and deposited within these systems. And the biotic communities then go through this massive boom cycle uh, when water returns to the system. In Australia and in other arid land areas, one of the response variables that you often see is that, um, that these large, uh, long-distance migratory bird communities come into these systems and then exploit this resource. And I know some of the food web work done in Australia has very nicely shown that when these systems go through that boom phase, uh, a large part of the biogeochemical processing ends up in the highest trophic levels. So there is a really boom that, that goes all the way up into the highest trophic levels. I contacted a couple of colleagues of mine that I've known for a number of years, Peter and Kathy Jacobson, who are now at Grinnell College, because I had heard over the years some of their work in some very interesting dryland systems in Namibia. Uh, these are systems where the water comes from very, very far away uh, on, in, on some uh, mesa land, and then the water can you know, travel over hundreds of kilometers and then uh, enter into the ocean. And this is through one of the drier deserts in all of the world, the Namibian desert. <clears throat> 
These are the, the research station, and if you look, you can see around the research station, there's hardly any vegetation except along this dryland river corridor. And here is the, the river, the Kusev River. Uh, this river, uh, at least in the period of time that they worked there, uh, at one point went for four years without any flows. But then you can have years where they actually have flows that might be up to a couple months long. And so the mobilization of a lot of the organic matter that you can see in that colored water and that deposition then becomes the base of a very active heterotrophic food web. Uh, a lot of uh, fungal activity, which then is, uh, it goes into to the next level consumers. And ultimately, uh, there are both lions and elephants that move around from dryland river to dryland river, somehow able to figure out which ones have had flows and which ones then actually have food resources that they can exploit. Amazing example of how uh, these kind of dryland rivers play an important ecological role in these, in, in these systems. In many of the Australian systems, uh, these kinds of dryland waterholes become a very important refugia during the bust period. Uh, so here's a just picture going down to a, a regional photograph, and then one of the discrete waterholes. And, and Stewart's group and Christie worked a lot at these kind of systems over, their, uh, over the years they were there. These waterholes become very important refugia. Steve Hamilton, who's here in the office or here in the audience, has looked at, uh, at where the water comes from in these systems, and these systems are pretty much all surface water fed, no groundwater. Uh, and they do, over time, slowly evaporate away. But some of them are persistent, persistent over the uh, long periods of dryness, and these become then a key refugia for many of the aquatic bio, uh, biota in these systems. And waterhole persistence is a very important issue, and it's an issue to consider, I think, very substantively as we think about a changing climate, a warmer climate, and potentially a more variable uh, precipitation regime. So you can just see some examples then of these waterholes. Some of them do draw, go to dryness. Uh, others do persist uh, over the periods that, uh, of dryness that we've seen. And mapping where they are on the landscape becomes a very important aspect of understanding uh, these aquatic systems through time. There is another kind of permanent aquatic feature in many arid lands, and it's one that I think many of you may not have thought about, and I certainly only in the last few years have become engaged in thinking about this, and it's through my interactions with some of my colleagues in geology. Uh, Laura Crossy and Carl Karlstrom are colleagues of mine at the University of New Mexico, and I want to explain to you what this map is. This is a map of the western United States, so if that helps you, there's Missouri, you know, basically, Texas, we're looking at Oklahoma here. And what you're looking at here is a graph of P wave velocities 100 kilometers down in the Earth's crust. And the warmer colors are examples of where the P wave velocities are slower. And it's because the, the, the rocks at that depth uh, are either semi-viscous or molten. And in the areas over here, they're not. They're solidified rock. And what you find in these areas then where you have this kind of tectonic activity is that there is interaction at least with the gases and maybe to some extent with the fluids between the surface and these tectonically active regions. And the green dots that you see on this map are measures of helium-3 concentration. The only known source of helium-3 is from magma. And so what you see in many of these springs, like Yellowstone National Park, which would make sense, but all up and down the Rio Grande Rift, where you are right now, certainly within California, extending uh, up, up into uh, the Cascadia region, are these areas with excess helium-3. And the only way you can get that helium-3 into these springs, and all of these dots are springs, is to have some connectivity with these deep gases. The waters and the fluids in many of these springs are very, very old, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years old but they're persistent aquatic features on the landscape. And they become the same kind of refugia that you saw in the Australian water holes are also some of the important refugia for aquatic biota in many of these tectonically area, uh, active areas of the United States. Uh, my colleague at the University of New Mexico, Laura Crossy, has dubbed these continental smokers with the idea that this fluid actually percolates down to depth, gets warmed, but they're usually cool features once they hit the surface again because of the slow, long pathways that the water takes. So if you go to some of these, for example, here in New Mexico, and there are some nice examples close by, and so I threw in a map to just to show you a few of these. Uh, here we are in Santa Fe. Here's Albuquerque. 
Here's Socorro. Here's the Socorro magma body, one of the closest proximities of molten lava to the surface in the western United States. Uh, some of you have been up in the Valle Caldera uh, or the Bandelier National Monument. That's here. And then just, these are just some of the springs, pictures of some of these springs uh, where this endogenic fluid is rising to the surface. And as you can see, many of these streams are also travertine depositing systems. So they're excess when the CO2 degasses, calcium carbonate precipitates out. And these features now are ones that we're beginning to look at both from a biogeochemical perspective and from an aquatic ecological perspective as some of the aquatic refugia and arid lands here in the western United States. It's not just in the United States, however, that this is an important process. Similar kinds of things happen in Australia. The Great Artesian Basin is recharged along here. The water flows down in this direction, taking a million to two million years transit time. But all of these springs down in here are again fed from this deep fluids, deep endogenic fluids. And Laura and her husband just got back from some sampling here. And again, I think they're seeing excess helium-3 in, uh, in some of these springs. And these mound springs, again, become very important features of the landscape in Australia and in these dry land river systems. Turn to the Rio Grande, since that's a river here close to, to where I'm living. And one of the things that uh, arid land rivers also, I think, need to, uh, we need to understand better is the water budget of these systems. So for the last decade, our research group's been focusing on that. One of the things that we've been trying to do is quantify some of the uh, uh, various components of the water budget. Here's Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're kind of up in here. Uh, basically, if you look, this is the Rio Grande corridor going through New Mexico. For those of you who know the Seviedo Long-Term Ecological Research Site, it's down here. And that dark green linear feature that you see through here is the riparian area. The Spanish word bosque is used to explain this area. And the lighter green that you see here is then the irrigated agriculture along this, along this reach of river. And this river, uh, the, the, one of the sort of fundamental questions that was asked of, uh, asked of me about a decade ago is, how much water does this riparian area use versus how much water does the, does the agricultural lands use? And so for the last 10 years, we've been using eddy covariance technology to actually quantify fluxes of water from these various types of habitats, both agriculture and riparian. And here's an example of the kind of data that you get. You work awful hard to get an annual cycle. We've done this now for 10 years uh, for all of these various types of habitats. And these are individual daily numbers in the dots. And then this is just a smoothing regression that we use to try to estimate. But basically, the numbers that we're getting for this riparian corridor, this dark green line, is that about uh, 15 to 30 percent of the loss term, depending on the year, is actually going right through those trees as of evapotranspiration. Number not too different from the actual amount of water being used in the agricultural lands. It's, the agricultural lands are slightly larger, but it's, but it's in that same ballpark. And this, uh, one of the other things about these arid land systems that I'd like to highlight is that these arid land systems uh, that have been studied in any detail worldwide are also very, very retentive of nutrients. Um, the boom and bust, uh, when they do have boom times and they do have nutrient capital available to them, they tend to be very efficient processors of that material. And you're looking here at the Diamantina floodplain in Australia. And you can see this very distributary na nature of the floodplain. Well, the Rio Grande also has a distributary uh, system. It's man-made. It's the distributary system that we use to move water out of the channelized Rio Grande out into our agricultural lands. And when you actually begin to look then at the nutrient processing within these systems, you find that when you look at the channel, at this, this reach of the river, it's 300 kilometers long in its channelized form. But you start looking at the areas along the river where the agricultural activity occurs, and it's over 2,100 kilometers. So you have all of this extra processing capability. And even in areas that are highly enriched with urban wastewater, that water, when it's taken out of the river and put into this agricultural area, comes back cleaner than it was. So we actually see the agricultural lands being a mechanism for nutrient uptake and processing. And some of the work that David Van Horn, who just finished here recently, a doctoral student of mine, has, has shown is that uh, basically when the waters are being used for, agri uh, for agriculture, there is a tremendous enhancement of the water quality versus when the winter months when it's just running in the channel. There is, however, a substantive cost there, and that is a cost of the water used to actually then uh, to support the agricultural activity. 
And if you want to do this on a global scale, this is a nice plot that comes from Nina Caracco and Jonathan Cole's work where you look at population density of people and look at, in this case, the export of nitrate. And you can see this general trend with increasing population. You see increasing export of nitrate. But you also see a number of sites that don't quite fall on that long-term trend line. And if you look at those, it's the Zambezi, the Orange, the Nile, the Murray Darling, and the Rio Grande. And again, this is, a, I think, a, a phenomenon. You're seeing this phenomenon then of this uh, high level of processing of nutrients that these arid land systems seem to be capable of doing. And we have some similar numbers to suggest that's also true of phosphate. So now for the buggered part, I'll turn it over to Stuart Bunn. Thanks, Cliff. A um, number of people have suggested to me that I should explain um, what we mean by this term. And, uh, Suffice to say that it has a number of meanings in Australia, and, and I, I don't need to go into all of them, but the, the term that we uh, use very commonly in Australia is really to describe systems or, or things that are not in particularly good shape. And so, you know, we might describe this kangaroo as looking particularly buggered, um, and we use that term to describe uh, uh, river systems that are not in a particularly good condition as well. And so what I'm going to do in the last part of this talk is really look at what are some of the, the threats to dryland river systems and some of the challenges uh, both for science and society. And clearly one of the biggest pressures that are threatening dryland rivers right across the world is current, the current levels of water resource development. And this affects dryland rivers in, in a couple of different ways. In, in many of the Australian systems, a lot of the larger floodwaters are harvested directly or intercepted by irrigation or, or farming uh, on the floodplain. And systems like this, this is one of the big uh, floodplain irrigation farms, cotton farm in, in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, it, that particular one, I think, holds, has the capacity to hold 500 gigalitres of water. It's about 400,000 uh, acre feet. It can intercept nearly the entire median annual flow um, in that system. It's, it's the biggest privately owned irrigation system in the southern hemisphere. And these systems were allowed to develop because our current water laws or our previous water laws were based on European notions of rivers where all of the, the water would be in the channel and so water out on the floodplain was never considered to be part of the, uh, the flow regime. And so we see uh, levels of, of over extraction of water in some of these uh, um, dryland systems. We also see direct exploitation from the river systems through direct pumping uh, during the dry season. And many of the arid systems in Australia and in other parts of the world are, are heavily exploited for, largely for irrigation. In addition to that, there's the added insult of what a future climate's going to bring. And these are some summaries, I guess, of temperature and, and precipitation trends uh, under a future climate for Australia. And many of the dryland systems in the world are, are likely to suffer a very, very similar fate. And so we're likely to see these systems become hotter and drier and even more variable in their rainfall regimes. Um, and that's going to pose even greater pressures on, on the resource in those particular systems. And if you take one of the examples, and this is an example from uh, Australia, and probably you'll see, many of you will be familiar with some of the issues that have been going on in the Murray-Darling Basin. This is Australia's largest agriculturally, uh, agricultural area um, in the country, and it's, as a dryland system, has been heavily exploited uh, by agriculture uh, over the last 100 or so years. This particular plot here uh, looks at the percentage change in discharge um, as a result of uh, diversions largely for agriculture. And it's quite well known within Australia that this system has been over-exploited and the levels of uh, extraction have been unsustainable and the, the Murray-Darling system is in, in, in a terrible, terrible shape. If you look at what the climate predictions are for this particular part of the world, and this is on the right-hand side, uh, a medium climate scenario up until 2030, this is the level of flow reduction that's likely to occur under a medium climate scenario. And so we can expect to see a further reduction of about 10% uh, in terms of um, annual flow um, in the northern part of the basin, about 13 per cent in the southern part of the basin. But the more extreme climate predictions, under an extremely dry climate, you could end up with as much as uh, 34 per cent less uh, water available within that river system. 
And under the new Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which has been developed now, there are attempts to address the current levels of over-exploitation, taking into account what a future climate may hold. And it's highly likely that the new uh, Murray-Darling Basin Plan will mean a 30 to 40 per cent reduction in, in water available for agriculture. And so we're going to see some really uh, tough decisions made over the next few years in terms of trying to address these levels of over-exploitation. Just focusing on one of the catchments there, the, the uh, Macquarie River, um, the Macquarie Marshes is a well-known internationally recognised wetland system at the bottom end of the Macquarie River. This is a system that's likely to suffer a, a further reduction of about 6 per cent in terms of its uh, mean annual flow under a median climate. Could be again as much of a third of a reduction in, in its mean annual flow. And even under a modest climate prediction, the area, of, uh, the inundation frequency of the marshes is likely to decline uh, by 10 per cent. And this is a system, again, that's been heavily affected already by levels of exploitation and is likely to be affected um, even further under a future climate. Cliff put this uh, diagram up to really describe the nature of variability across these dryland systems and noting, of course, that rivers like the Colorado and the Rio Grande have a relatively uh, persistent flow compared with some of the more boom and bust uh, cycling systems in Africa and, and Australia. And one of the, uh, one of the things that, uh, that may occur under a future climate is these systems which are dependent on snow melt and in other parts of the world dependent on glacial runoff may well become much more variable under a future climate and certainly may start to uh, behave in more similar ways to the dryland systems that we've been looking at um, in Australia. And so what we might see are river systems that be characterised by hydrographs like this with a, a relatively stable base flow, seasonal decline in their flow regime to ones that become increasingly more seasonal and intermittent in their flow regime and ultimately more like the ones that we're seeing in Australia, which have a high uh, level of intermittency and a high level of unpredictability. And so, um, in a way that when we look at what the future might hold for dryland systems of the world, the ones that we're seeing in this part of the world, which are currently uh, characterised by a, a more stable flow regime, may in fact uh, become more, more, uh, more similar to those that we're seeing in uh, places like Africa and Australia. Just wanted to turn now to the end of what some of the science challenges may be then in, in dealing with these uh, future changes in water availability in dryland systems. And certainly there are a number of science challenges and I just wanted to touch on one or two of them here. One of the things that's become very apparent in our dealings with uh, the, the study of dryland systems is that there's a complete mismatch in our, in our capability and our, our understanding about um, measuring flows for human needs and for environmental needs. And what I mean by that is that most of the systems that we have in place for measuring water availability for human need, our gauging stations, our monitoring networks, are designed for measuring the large flow events. They're, they're really aimed at measuring yield. And when we come down to looking at what are the critical features for these systems for the environment, they're typically around the very low flow end of the, the hydrograph. And most of our modelling capability, the modelling capability that our water resource planning uses and most of our gauging network is incapable of giving us really precise information around the uh, low flow end. And so critical issues, critical aspects of the flow regime like the cease to flow uh, timing, uh, dry spell duration, those low flow parameters are very, very difficult to um, obtain from our current gauging and, and uh, monitoring network. And all of these, of course, are going to be very critical to the persistence of these water holes and refugia in these dryland systems. What that means is a real challenge to bring together a range of different methodologies for measuring where water is in the landscape, both in space and time. And so there's a real need here to bring together the conventional surface hydrology with remote sensing, uh, using sensor networks, depth sensors and so on and also combining that with uh, direct measures of uh, surface water, groundwater chemistry, and allows us then to map where the refugia are in space and time. Accompanying that, there's a real need to use, get into some of the conservation planning tools, the systematic conservation planning tools, which can allow us to determine how many refugia do we need, which ones in the landscape are most important. 
And so we need to be able to map where water is in the landscape in space and time. This system here is showing where refugia are after a flow event, but knowing where they're likely to be if the dry spell durations exceed a particular time interval. And this is very difficult to do under our current uh, monitoring systems. Another aspect of that is on a larger spatial scale is looking at how other organisms perceive these arid zone environments. And this is a really nice example of how water birds perceive this arid landscape in central Australia. Birds are capable of flying over a thousand kilometres, see the landscape in a very, very different way. And even though this is the most unpredictable flowing part of the country, Water birds see this as a very predictable part of the landscape in which to breed. And there's always water somewhere within a thousand kilometre radius to fly. That poses a big challenge then about what a future climate may hold. And also it poses some challenges about how we manage the flow regimes in dryland systems because we can't simply manage one river in isolation to what's going on um, in other river systems. And finally, I want to turn to what some of the societal challenges may be. And certainly one of the great challenges we face is how to become more efficient in the way that we use water in, in dryland systems. And these are some OECD data on changes in uh, on-farm water use over the last uh, decade or so from uh, the period up till 1992 and then 2001 to 2003. And you'll see during that period the uh, water use per uh, megalitres per hectare of irrigated land declined by 50% in Australia over that period. So that's a changing to more water efficient crops, making uh, greater um, improvements to water use efficiency on farm. And those improvements are not seen in many other dryland areas of the world. And finally, I'll just leave up some, because uh, I'm out of time I know, leave up some measures of, of our urban water use just to highlight that uh, during the recent drought in Australia, urban water users in Australia reduced their uh, per capita consumption from around 87 gallons per day down to less than 40 gallons per day. And even after the drought's broken, it's only returned up to about 40 gallons a day. If you look at those figures for California and, and even for places like here in Santa Fe, it's, it's clear that there's a lot of improvements that can be made in terms of the way in which we use water in, our, um, in urban centres in our arid lands. And really it's a challenge for our scientists, I guess, to convince the broader community that river systems like these are more va valuable than hosing down their driveways and uh, having green lawns. And on that, I thank you very much.